I never get the shoulds and the coulds mixed up until this morning, and now I know why. But we were in harmony. We were. We are in uh, Mark chapter six this morning. We're going to begin the chapter and look at verses one through thirteen. Chapter five is an interesting chapter. It's a chapter with three miracles. The Lord goes over to the east side of the. Sea of Galilee to the Gerizines, and he delivers a man of a legion of demons, a wild man who was put into his right mind, and then he sails back across to the western shore where he does two more miracles. He heals a woman with an issue of blood. She'd had that for 12 years, exhausted all of her money trying to get help from the physicians without any success, and then he heals a 12-year-old girl, raising her from the dead. Some uh, great miracles. And now we come to uh, really, in a sense, unexpected response in chapter 6. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things, and what is this wisdom given to him, and such miracles as these performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could do no miracles there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. And he summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you, as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. They went out and preached that men should repent. And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying together. Let's pray. Aesop's fables are short lessons on life. They're Gentile parables that end with a moral. The story of the fox and the lion tells of the first time the fox saw a lion. It was so scared that it ran and hid in the woods. The second time the king of the beasts came near, it was nearly not nearly so fearful, and the fox only stopped a safe distance away. The third time they came near each other, the fox went right up to the lion and had a conversation and asked how his family was and when they might meet again. Then turning his tail to the lion, he walked away unworried. The moral of the story is familiarity breeds contempt. It does and did for the people in a synagogue in Nazareth. When Jesus came to preach, he entered with the aura and power of a lion. But when he finished his sermon, they said, Is not this the carpenter? And they took offense at him. In some ways, this is a strange chapter in Jesus' life. When he returned home, he was riding the crest of popularity. But instead of receiving him as the hometown hero, they rejected him. 
On the other hand, it's really not so strange. People can hear the truth so often and become so familiar with it that they lose interest and even begin to loathe it. What happened in the synagogue can happen in the church. We can drift. We can leave our first love. That's certainly one of the lessons of the passage, and it is a warning for us. Jesus had just done a mighty miracle. He had raised the daughter of Jairus from the dead. Matthew wrote that news spread throughout all the land. Mark indicates in verse 1 that Jesus came from Jairus' house to Nazareth. He wrote, he went from there to his hometown. So news of the miracle would likely have preceded him. His disciples were all with him, which suggests that he was there not to visit his family, probably did that, but he was there to minister. So on the Sabbath, they all went to the synagogue and he began to teach. Mark doesn't give his sermon. If Luke 4 is a parallel passage to this, then the sermon was on Isaiah chapter, 50, or Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And it speaks of how he preached to them good news. It's a prophecy about the Messiah. Oh, there were a lot of people in the synagogue. Mark says that. And it is certain they had never heard a sermon like that, preached with such authority, preached with such clarity. And they were all astonished, he says. But very quickly their astonishment became unbelief. Where did this man get these things, they were asking? Where did he get such insight? Where did he get such wisdom, such authority? What is this wisdom given to him and such miracles as these performed by his hands? And they didn't deny the miracles. They didn't deny the wisdom. They just couldn't fathom the origin of it and the origin of his power. Now some have suggested that there is some dark suspicion behind their question. Something like we saw of the Pharisees in chapter 3 that the source is not God but the devil. So they weren't responding to his ministry with approval, but with skepticism. And in verse 3, they give the reason for their doubt. We know him. We've known him since he was a boy. We know his parents. We know his brothers. We know his sisters. Is not this the carpenter? Yes, of course it is. Jesus is well known in the town and evidently throughout the region of Galilee for being the carpenter. He'd grown up in Joseph's shop, but Joseph had evidently died and Jesus had taken over the business. This was his trade. Every Jewish boy learned a trade and Jesus was a carpenter. I can't think of a more appropriate trade for the Son of Man to have than that. Carpenter takes simple pieces of wood and fashions them into objects of beauty and utility, things of use. It is what he did in the beginning. It is what he did when the world was formless and void. He brought order out of chaos. He fashioned the world into a place of light and life. When it was finished, it was all very good. And I'm sure that the Lord got the same pleasure out of the things that he made in that shop. It must have all been very good, the finest furniture in the region. He was a craftsman. He was known as the carpenter. But he was far more than a carpenter. And that is what these men couldn't see. They watched him grow up in Nazareth, an unimportant town and a backwater region of Galilee. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He hadn't studied with the rabbis. He worked with his hands all of his life. Had probably worked for some of these men in the synagogue. Their familiarity with him made it hard to see who he was through the appearance of his ordinariness. 
It hindered them from knowing him truly. He was only a carpenter to them. And so Mark says, they took offense at him. Where did he get this knowledge of the Bible? Where, where did he get this, this insight and all this wisdom? Where did he get this authority in which he speaks to us in the way he speaks to us? Who does he think he is? He's just a servant. In the early days of the church, the Romans despised Christianity as a slave's religion. And it was. The Roman Empire was built on slavery, and many of those slaves found hope in the gospel. And the reality is, those slaves were freer than their masters. But the Roman pagans didn't know that, and the Roman pagans didn't see the power and the hope of the gospel and what those people had within themselves. They could only see the externals of Christianity. It was a simple, crude, slave's religion. It didn't have the marble temples that they had. It didn't have the Pontifex Maximus that they had. It didn't have all the things, the outward show that they had. And so they rejected that simple religion. Well, so too the men in Nazareth. They were blinded by the externals, by Jesus' ordinariness. So they took offense at him and rejected him. Familiarity breeds contempt. The Lord responded to their offense at him with a proverb. A prophet, he said, is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. Very often the hardest place to be a witness for the gospel is in one's own home and to one's own family, to a, a brother or a sister because they know us so well and, and because of that they take offense so easily. Why are you talking to me like that? Who do you think you are? You're my little sister. Well, that's very biblical. We see that from the book of Genesis on. You know the story of Joseph. We covered it not too many months ago. They hated him. Well, they had reason they felt, perhaps, because their father Jacob showed favoritism toward Joseph and gave him this beautiful coat and made him stand out. But it really wasn't that as much as the revelation that he gave to him, to them when he spoke to them of his dreams and what that revealed. And they hated him for it. And when they got the opportunity, they threw him in a pit. They sold him to the Ishmaelites who took him down to Egypt and to slavery. And then there's David. Goliath challenges the armies of Israel every day standing out in the valley of Elah and the armies of Israel trembled in fear and then David comes one day to bring some supplies to his brothers and they want to know, what are you doing here? Why aren't you out taking care of the sheep? You're insolent, they said. You've just come here to see a battle. They opposed him. And then here in Mark's Gospel, we go back to chapter 3, and Jesus' natural brothers opposed him. They, they thought he had lost his senses. He's out of his mind. So, as Jesus indicates in his adage about a prophet being without honor, this, this response is not uncommon among those who are naturally closest to us. But with the Lord and his family and friends, it is significantly different. He suggests that here. He didn't, he didn't say directly that he was a prophet, but that is the clear implication of his proverb. He was telling the men of Nazareth that they were rejecting someone who was more than a carpenter. He was a prophet. In fact, he is the prophet that Moses spoke of and prophesied in Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15. He is the Messiah. He's the Son of Man. He's the Son of God. They rejected that. But there are always consequences for unbelief, and the immediate consequence here was a lack of blessing in Nazareth. Mark says in verse 5, and he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Well, that's what happened 
in the previous chapter in the Gerizines on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. They saw the results of the Lord's power and His miracle. The shepherds went into the village and told them what had happened. This wild man had been delivered of a legion of demons and they came out to see it and they could see the evidence there out on the Sea of Galilee were the corpses of the pigs bobbing in the water and then they looked over at Jesus and there was this wild man who had chains on his wrists who had been naked and a terror to the region sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed and in his right mind. They saw the evidence of his greatness and the blessing that he could bring and they asked him to leave. So he did. And they got no blessing. But this is really much worse. The men of Nazareth knew Jesus. And where there is greater light, there was always greater responsibility and greater consequences for rejecting it. They had heard a sermon full of wisdom and revelation. They knew his miracles. They didn't deny any of that. They just couldn't accept it coming from him. But it certainly did. So they were without excuse. And as a result, they were cut off from blessing. He could do no miracle. Their unbelief prevented that. Now it wasn't that their rejection of him and their unbelief so frustrated his power that he just couldn't do anything. They can't frustrate him. They weren't coming to him to be healed because of their unbelief. They walked away. They turned away from him. A few did believe and came and they were healed, but the town as a whole turned away from Jesus. Their response satisfied their pride, but it was to their own self-destruction. It was reckless. And Jesus was amazed, amazed at their response. In fact, Mark wrote in verse 6 that he wondered at their unbelief. The word wondered is used frequently in the Gospels of people marveling. Sometimes it's translated marveled at the Lord, marveled at His miracles. It's used twice of the Lord in, in three passages. Two of them are parallel passages, uh, uh, but of two separate incidents. Uh, one of them is recorded in Luke 9 and also in Matthew 8. One that we referred to last week, as uh, I remember, the Lord marveled at the centurion, marveled at a Gentile who showed greater faith than anyone in Israel. A man who had less privilege, less light than the Jews, was a man who had more faith in Christ, who understood more than they did, and he marveled at his faith. He wondered at it. And here, the other occasion, Jesus wondered at their lack of faith. The people who knew him the longest, who we would think knew him the best, who had the greatest privilege, where faith was most to be expected, had none. Those two incidents lay great stress on what is really important. We're impressed with many things. We're impressed with expensive things. We're, ex we're impressed with big things. We're impressed with powerful things. But what is really wonderful to the Lord is faith. Simple faith. Trusting in Him. Believing Him. Believing in His Word. Come after me, He says. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Trust me, follow me, and I will transform your life. That's faith. That's what is wonderful to the Lord. Well, these men obviously were not able or willing to trust in Him and follow Him. The emphasis here is on the complete folly of unbelief that in the face of such compelling evidence and clear teaching, people will willingly, willingly cut themselves off from blessing and do so from pride, which is really an, an, an outworking, a fruit of unbelief. That is a wonder of a different kind. 
The people do it for different reasons. The Romans would have nothing to do with Christianity because it was lowly, it was beneath them, a slave's religion. In Nazareth, the men rejected Jesus because he was not above them. They knew him, they thought. He's just a carpenter. There is a danger in being familiar with someone or something. A danger in getting used to it so that it seems common. A danger in losing an, an interest in a blessing over time. Israel did that. We see that throughout Israel's history. When they came out of slavery in Egypt where they had lived on a slave's diet, God provided for them in the desert. He, he set out a banquet for them in the wilderness. He gave them bread from heaven, manna. It was wonderful. It was heavenly food. Its taste was like wafers with honey. The psalmist, Asaph, called it the bread of angels, angel food. The finest chefs in Egypt could not have served Pharaoh anything like it. And the Hebrews didn't need to prepare it. The Lord provided it every day and twice as much on Friday so that they didn't have to even go out and gather it on, on the Sabbath. There it was every day, always there for them to pick up. And yet over time they got used to it, they got familiar with it, they got bored with it and began to grumble about it and speak of it as this manna. Later, after four centuries of their history of rule under the judges, after Samuel <clears throat> had given the nation victory and decades of peace and prosperity, they rejected him. And they asked for a king like the Gentiles have. We want all that regal and that pomp. We want a man with a palace and a man with a throne and a man with a crown and a great army. God told Samuel, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. And that's always the problem. The real problem is not familiarity. Now, there is a sense, and it's true, familiarity can breed contempt, and it often does, as we've seen. But familiarity should result in just the opposite. Familiarity should result in a deeper understanding of a subject, or an increasing appreciation of a person and a love for him or her. The problem in spiritual matters, the, the problem in the, the synagogue in Nazareth, was not familiarity, it was unbelief, a lack of faith. That's what Jesus wondered at. How could they have been so familiar with him, known him from his childhood, observed his obedience to his parents, his integrity in business, his skill in his trade, and not have adored him? How could they have heard of his power and miracles, heard his exposition of Isaiah, heard his clear teaching and his wisdom in the greatest sermon they had ever heard, and reject him? Not familiarity. Familiarity is what condemned them. It is unbelief. That's the problem. In spite of all that they had seen, they wanted nothing to do with Jesus and rejected him as only a carpenter. They were blind, willingly, spiritually blind and unbelieving. But such things go on in the church today. One excuse you hear for not observing the Lord's Supper weekly is if we do that, it'll become common and not very special. Familiarity breeds contempt. No, not if it's taken in remembrance of him, which he told us to do. It is a reminder of who he is and what he has done. It is vital to our spiritual life. How can, how can that become too familiar? How can reflecting deeply upon the person of Jesus Christ, which is an infinite subject, how can reflecting on the work that he's done on the cross, which is the greatest subject of all, how can that become too familiar? It's not the subject that makes it that. It's unbelief that makes it that. Or people tire of Bible teaching. That happens. Paul 
warns of people in the church who want their ears tickled, who want something new, something interesting. That's unbelief. People can drift from the truth. That's what the author of Hebrews deals with early in his book. He warns those Hebrew Christians, you're drifting. And that was due to a weakened faith. They weren't trusting in the promises. They weren't trusting in the Lord. They were weakening in their faith. Churches can drift from Christ and they can leave Him. That's what the church at Ephesus did. For all of the accolades that the Lord gives them in Revelation chapter 2, there was a fundamental flaw. They had left their first love. Familiarity breeds contempt? No. That was boredom due to unbelief. Jesus had the remedy. Jesus told them to remember from where they had fallen and repent. In other words, get reacquainted. Get more familiar. When we find ourselves becoming uninterested in spiritual things, and listen, all of us will do that. All of us face that trial, that temptation. We all do. But when, that, when we do that, when that happens, it is a red flag. It is a warning. We're drifting We're slouching toward Nazareth. That is dangerous. As a result of their unbelief, Jesus left Nazareth just as He left the Gerasenes when the people there rejected Him. Jesus went on to other towns in Galilee teaching them, bringing light there, bringing blessing there. Now this must have been instructive for the disciples who were there as the response of the people in the Gerasenes must also have been instructive to them. Because what they saw in that is Jesus being rejected. And the conclusion would be, well, if He is rejected, then certainly we can be rejected. And that would give them perspective, perspective that they needed next, because the next thing we read about in verses 7 through 13 is Jesus sends them on a mission. J. Gresham Machen spoke of the high adventure of the Christian religion. And he may have had this passage in mind, or he certainly had a passage similar to it in mind, because this would be for them, for those disciples, an adventure in faith. Jesus sent the twelve out on a mission with very little to support them other than their faith in Him. He sent them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. The one the men of Nazareth dismissed as the carpenter was more than that. He is able to give his friends and representatives authority over the demons and power over sickness, the ability to liberate people and to heal people. He's more than a carpenter. They would go out with His authority, but they would go out with little else. He told them in the next verses that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money belt, but to wear sandals. And He added, do not put on two tunics. So He he sent them out adequately equipped, but equipped with only the bare essentials, with a staff and a companion. And those were necessary for their journey. They needed a staff for physical stability since they would walk over the rough roads of Galilee. And they needed a companion for spiritual support and encouragement. Now that's, that's generally the, the pattern in the Lord's missions, going out in pairs. Paul traveled in a kind of entourage. He didn't go out by himself. His first missionary journey, he's with Barnabas and Mark. And second missionary journey, he's with Luke and Timothy and others. That is wise. We need to have mutual support. We need to be with other believers. But what they were not to take is particularly instructive. They were to travel light. No extra tunic, but also without bread, bag, belt, without a money belt. The the bag may be what some have called a begging wallet. 
there were lots of traveling philosophers in that day. Some of them were, were the cynics who would preach their philosophy, and they would have as part of their equipment the begging wallet. That's how they supported themselves. They would ask for money. They would beg for money. Well, Jesus was clearly telling the disciples that they were not to do that. They were not to go out soliciting or selling. In Matthew's account, he tells them, freely you received, freely give. The gospel is free. It is not to be peddled. So they were sent out without material provisions. First, as a message, the gospel is free. And secondly, as a test, so that they would look to the Lord for their support. Was he just a carpenter? Or was he more? Could he provide all that they needed and provide for them adequately according to his word, according to his promise? Now, that was the test. And that's what they were asked to trust. And uh, so they would look to him. And they did. And what they found is that he's faithful. He's faithful to his word. He provides as we walk by faith, always. Our ultimate trust is in the Lord, not man. Men will fail. They always do. Christians may even fail in their responsibility to, their responsibility to provide for Christian workers. But God won't fail. He cannot fail. He cares for his people and workers more than we do. He knows what's happening. He, he follows us with his eye. It's always upon us. So we're to look to him and rely on his providence to provide. This is uh, so unlike the church today. We've all received letters from Christian organizations, good organizations, asking for money. It's, it's the way things are done today. We don't do that here. Uh, you know that. We don't take up an offering in the morning. In the early days when the church began and the elders were formulating what they were going to do and it was their intention to establish this church strictly according to New Testament principles and they would not ask for money and they were told early on, well, that won't work. You, you can't run a church without asking for money. Dr. Johnson was told that. And he said, well, that's what we're going to do, whether it works or not. So they didn't ask for money, and God provided, always provided. He has provided through you. This is a generous church. You are a giving people. And God's faithfulness is exercised through you. But he's always faithful. Still, it is a test of faith. It's a test to trust in the hidden hand of God. It's a challenge. And the faith of the disciples would be tested. So Jesus tells them in verses 10 and 11 what to expect. Now, they, they might have expected, and you can imagine that they did, that, that they would be well received. After all, they had the message of the good news. They had the message of the kingdom and the king. They had the greatest message that was, that was preached anywhere in the world. And they had authority and power, power and, th and authority over demons and disease. Surely they would be accepted. But they wouldn't be. They would be rejected. And so... The Lord tells them how they were to respond to those who did receive them and those who did not receive them. First, he tells them in verse 10 that they were to enter a house, that is, uh, they were to go into those houses that received them, that is, that received the word that they had preached. They were to stay with believers, and they were to stay in their houses throughout the whole time they stayed in that town. Those were the people who received the message. They were the ones that were worthy of the disciples. But he said in verse 11 that when a house wouldn't receive them 
or listen to them, that they were to leave. And Jesus said, shake off the dust of the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. Now, that was a gesture that the Jews would have recognized immediately because when Jews left Gentile lands, perhaps they'd been traveling as merchants in the lands of the Gentiles. As they entered the land of Galilee or Judea, as they came back into the Holy Land, the Promised Land, they would take off their sandals and shake off the dust from the Gentile lands, which was polluted. It was a way of saying they will not pollute the Holy Land. And the disciples were to make that same gesture, and in doing, doing so, make it clear to those who rejected the gospel that they were no better than those pagan Gentiles in their unbelief. Workers in the gospel, Christians, should expect rejection. But as the Lord taught in the parable of the soils, we can also expect success and reception. The chapter ends, they went out and preached that men should repent, and they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. So the Lord blessed them in all that they did. When we are faithful to him and go out trusting that he never sends us into the world unequipped, we are blessed. Christ is more than a carpenter. If we know him, we know that. But we need to become more familiar with him. Familiarity breeds contempt for the Lord and the things of God only when it is familiarity gotten without faith. But when we become familiar with him through faith, the result is a deeper understanding, a greater love, and more faith and courage. The fox in the parable became fearless. And as we know Christ, we fear the challenges less because we trust the Lord more. And that leads to a good witness. That leads to a courageous witness. One of the Roman emperors who persecuted the church was Diocletian. There's a story that when a Christian bishop was brought before Caesar, he mocked the man and asked, and pray, what is your carpenter doing now? And the bishop said, he's busy making a coffin for your majesty and for your empire. <laughs> well, the answer cost him his life, but it's true. The emperor is gone. The empire is gone. What about those Romans who rejected Christianity as a slave's religion? Or people who reject Christ because they can't believe that he is more than a man? Or can't believe that salvation is a free gift received through faith alone? Now we've got to add something to it. Whatever the reason, people reject him at their peril. Nazareth lost miracles. And people today lose peace, and they lose more than that. They lose eternal life. Now that is something to wonder at. Someone would have the, offer, uh, the opportunity for complete forgiveness, for justification, for being clothed in the righteousness of Christ, being a son, a child, a daughter of God, with an, a glorious future, and they reject it. That is something to wonder at. If you're here and you've not believed in him, know he is God's son and man's savior. Trust in him while you have opportunity because when those who have heard him and said, go away, said that, he went away. And their opportunity went with it. Receive him. Believe in him. He receives all who do. It makes them Sons and daughters of God with a glorious future and an adventurous present. He's with us and provides for us and asks us to serve him and to bless us in that service. Let's stand and sing a hymn. Let's... Father, we do adore your son. 
He's more than a carpenter. He was a good one. But he's more than that. More than a man, he was a perfect man. He's the God-man who is now seated on his throne. And we give you praise for his entrance into this world to be humbled, to be humbled unto the death of a cross and yet raised from the grave, triumphant, and we with him, every one of us who have joined ourselves to him through faith, we're with him, risen with him, we have a glorious future, but again, a glorious present. Thank you for it. Thank you for him. May we never become so familiar that we lose our love for him. May our familiarity grow in faith and adoration. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.